All right, good morning. Good morning. It's always glad to be at the Bible conferences. Always a great opportunity to get to see folks from other parts of the country in other places and see what the Word of God, the Word of God's grace is doing in the lives of other saints in other places. Um, I want to just give a shout out to um, Shorewood Bible Church South, to folks that came to support me this morning. Uh, I have my mom back there and uh, Sister Margaret's brother Kenny and his wife, Sister Davis. Those are some of the folks from our fellowship and then we have Brother Bobby and Sister Floria uh, there in the front. Those are some of the folks from Shorewood Bible Church South. We're on the south side of Chicago. Uh, generally, when you come in, if you're coming in on the Dan Ryan, uh, you get around 87th Street, you're right in our neck of the woods. So if you're ever in that area, look us up sometime, come and visit. Um, uh, we have saints that would normally be here, but due to age and health, cannot be here. Um, so uh, some of you might know Sister Sarah, and um, she's been, um, she's had several heart attacks and, and, and a stroke, so she's... Uh, not able to be here with us. So I just want to mention her for those of you who know her. Take your Bibles, turn to Second Thessalonians chapter two. Second Thessalonians. Oops. What did I do? Okay. Um, let me get that out of my way. I got to see it, I guess. I see what they mean by small now. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's one of the things Pastor Jordan used to tell us. Uh, make sure you get up and check out your pulpit. You know, walk around it, look and see wh what you got to work with. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. My topic is sanctification, and the particular uh, uh, focus of my message is about how our positional sanctification is to be brought into uh, the experience of our lives uh, and to be the, you know, to be the expression of the good works God has created us to perform. You know, how our positional sanctification is to be brought in to our experience. And uh, as I thought about that, and, and I read First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians through, uh, one of the things that stood out to me is that helps me with this subject is to contrast the saints at Thessalonica with the saints at Corinth. And sort of the question or, you know, or, or the statement, how to be like the saints at Thessalonica rather than the saints at Corinth. And that says to me that that, that addresses the, 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 um, the question or the issue about how our positional sanctification is to be brought into our experience as good works that we were created to perform. Now, if you take a look at, um, well, I tell you what, let's, let's read Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. And then also the other text that I was given was First Thessalonians chapter 4. And uh, so Second Thessalonians 2.13, Paul writes, he says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Now, if you take a look at... Uh, Can you hear me? No. I think you'll hear me if you hear it. But okay. 
Now. Now it's on. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can't hear me. Testing, testing. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Um, First Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, maybe for the sake of the recording, let's read Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.13 again. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, Paul writes, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, vessel in sanctification and honor. Now let's bow our hearts in a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace with hearts of thanksgiving, thanking you for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for the salvation that we have in him. We thank you for the privilege and the blessing we have in being able to come together at such a meeting, together, together with other saints, especially those of like precious faith, as we gather together around your word for the study of your word. And as we do so, Heavenly Father, we pray for listening ears, believing hearts, and we pray when all is said and done, it will be to the glory and to the honor of your name and to our edification. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, um, now positional sanctification. Um, when, I, when, you, when you talk about positional sanctification, basically what we're talking about is the fact that we are saints because we are in Christ. Now, that's why we're saints. Uh, you might look at me as Ted walked over and said uh, something to the effect of uh, St. Art, uh, <laughs> something like that. And I say, I'm glad you could see it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we are saints not because so much of what we do as the fact that we're not sinners because of what we do. We're saints because of who God has made us in Christ. Like an individual is a sinner. Sin, not so much because of what they do, but because of who they are. And we are saints because of the fact that we are in Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. Paul writes here, he says, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus. That is, of God the Father are ye in Christ Jesus. Now, in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, all things are of God, who has reconciled us unto himself through Jesus Christ our Lord. All things are of God, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus. Now, as you read that, that, that speaks of our position. It speaks of the fact that we're in Christ due to something God Almighty himself has accomplished on our behalf. Who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. And when we think of the fact that we are in Christ, uh, we're complete in him, we're, we're perfect, uh, we've been made the righteousness of God in him. Again, that's our position. That's what's true of us because of the fact that we are in Christ. Look over at Romans chapter 6. Another idea about that is that we're dead to sin, and we're alive to God. That's our position. We are dead to sin, and we are alive unto God. Now, in Romans chapter 6, 
uh, verse 9, knowing that Christ, let's see, I'll tell you what, go back, uh, chap chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as have been bap as were baptized into Jesus Christ were what? Yes. Baptized into his death. Um, I just want to make the point that we're dead to sin. Uh, verse 8 says that now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died on, in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And it, it is that verse 10 that we're dead to sin, but we are alive unto God. Now, that's true of us, whether we live like it or not. We're dead to sin, and we've been made alive unto God. And that has to do something with our freedom. We've been made free from sin. And we're in a position to do something now that we were not able to do before we got saved. We've been put in a position that we can serve God. Okay? So we that's our position, though. We're, we're again... Now, the problem, I might say, is that who we are and what we are in Christ is not automatically reflected in the details of our life. Okay? Um, it's not revealed in our life automatically. Uh, look at Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verses 4 through 6. Paul writes here, he says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. Now watch this. He says, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now, that word should is, the, is a word of obligation. But it's not a word that speaks of something that is automatic in, in your life. Bringing forth fruit unto God is not something you do automatically. Okay? Uh, we're dead to sin. We're alive to God. But that doesn't demonstrate or doesn't reflect itself automatically in our lives. And when I speak of something being done automatically, I think of the day of Pentecost. And it says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And because they were, they were caused to do the things that God wanted them to do. Okay. Uh, that being filled with the Holy Spirit was the result of them being baptized with the Holy Ghost. That baptism with the Holy Ghost, again, was that enduring, that endowment with power from on high. Uh, if you look, keep your place there in uh, Romans. We're coming back there. But if you look at Acts chapter, Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 31, the apostles have been uh, beaten and threatened by the religious leaders not to preach in Jesus' name. And then having been let go, they joined the company of other believers. And um, back in uh, verse 20, um, 24, it says, And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hath made heaven and earth. And if you jump down to, again, to... Um, and what they, and Peter is praying for there and asking for there is proof that God was still with them. Verse 29, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Verse 30, By stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done 
by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of what? One heart, of one soul, neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Uh, there you see a, a, a demonstration of those that were filled with the Holy Ghost. And the, the, the results of that was a life, a behavior, a conduct that I, I advance as being produced by God, the Holy Spirit, in their lives. But was automatically produced because of the fact that they were baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now, when you think about our baptism, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Okay? Um, but by that one spirit. And that baptism doesn't result in an automatic change in life, an automatic change in behavior. Okay? It does result in, in some very important truths, it re an important truth, and that is our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. That baptism results in our total and complete identification with the Lord Jesus Christ, that when God the Father looks down from heaven, he doesn't see us as failing miserable sinners such as we are, but he sees us with all the righteousness of his Son. Okay, that's how, and that's the result of our baptism into the body of Christ, our baptism into Christ, total and complete identification with him. And that's true of us before we even, uh, you know, can really become quite oriented to, to the truth of what that is, to what that means. You know, that's true of us that moment, that instant, without having really learn anything other than the fact that Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day. And we believe that with our heart. With, you know, without knowing anything more than that, that moment, that instant, we are complete. We, we have been made the righteousness of God in him. And that's how God sees us. And that is the basis upon which God deals with us uh, on, on a daily basis. Again, based on our position in Christ. And so that total and complete identification doesn't automatically result again in change in a changed life. Okay? Now that's the goal. Ephesians 5:18, we are exhorted to be filled with the spirit. Now I I would submit to you that being filled with the spirit will produce in your life that which God wants produced in you. And it will be, as Philippians 2.13 says, it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The wanting to do it and the actual doing of it is all of God. And so the, uh, the goal to be filled with the Spirit, but how, that, how we are filled with the Spirit is fundamentally indifferent radically different, by the way, from how the kingdom church, the kingdom saints, was filled with the Holy Spirit. They were baptized with the Spirit, and that resulted in their being filled with the Spirit. We are baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ, but our filling is by an entirely different process than it was for them, and, and, and a little bit of that will come out as we move forward. Go back to Romans uh, chapter 7. And so my point is, um, is that though we are, that is who we are rather, and, and what we are in Christ is not automatically reflected or revealed in our life, uh, and, that's, and that's the problem. That is, we are perfect. We've been made the righteousness of God in him. But how to reflect that truth? how to reflect that reality 
And that's a reality. Uh, how to, to show that, how to demonstrate that in the experience of our lives, in the details of our lives on a daily basis, again, is what, what we're talking about here this morning. Uh, but bringing forth fruit unto God, that's God's desire for us. You see, that we should, we should bring forth fruit unto God. It's not automatic that we will. We should. Okay. Uh, if you jump down to uh, verses 14 through 18, Paul writes this. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold unto sin. And one of the things you learn uh, in studying Paul's epistles, especially the book of Romans, that being saved, again, as I've already stated, doesn't result in you being Christ-like. doesn't automatically do that. And one of the reasons that doesn't happen because our salvation is in three parts. We're justified, as you've already heard this week. We've been delivered from the penalty of sin. We're sanctified. We've been delivered from the power of sin. But we yet await. Now, we, we positionally, we've been glorified. But in truth, and in reality, we're, ra we're waiting for our glorification. And until we receive our glorification, we are still, we still carry about the old, the old man. And that's exactly what Paul is, is describing here in Romans chapter 7. Um, that we still carry about the old man. We hadn't rid ourselves of the old man. Um, sin dwelleth, as he teaches in this chapter, sin dwelleth where? In our flesh. And guess what? We still walk about in it. He says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And this is the dilemma. For that which I do I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but what? Sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. But how to perform that which is good? And that's the question. How to perform that which is good, he says, I find not. For the good that I would do, for the good that I would do, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now, again, in my flesh, that's where sin dwelleth. The psalmist says, my soul, the part of you that's you, my soul boweth down to the dust of the earth. And the idea behind that is if, if you hunger, if, you, if your body hungers, what do you do? You feed it. If it thirsts, you give it drink. You know, if, you know, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. And that works because of our kinship with the world. We're made of what? The dust of the earth. We have that. And so those things have uh, uh, a, a, a significant pull, a great pull. Now, if you're lost, it dominates you. You know, you're dead in those things. But when you get saved, God is 
done something for you, made it possible for you to do something you could not do before. Paul speaks of that as a spiritual circumcision, the cutting loose of your soul from your flesh, from your body. And for the first time in your life, you're free to do something you were not able to do before. You're, again, you're positioned. It's not automatic. You've been positioned now to do something you couldn't do before. But now you need to do something in, in order to enable the new man, okay, in, or, in order to able the new man to function, to operate, to thrive, and to flourish. And that doesn't come by being baptized with the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, you're baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ, but now there's something that's required in order for your life to function. And that is you have to build into the mentality of your soul the Word of God. Okay? You have to build that doctrine, the Word of God, the doctrine of the Lord. You have to build that into your, into your soul. I think I was talking to, I think it was Brother Timmy, about something I, have, I was giving thought to about how life works. And when you think about how your life works, well, the lost are saved. It operates on the basis of information. Okay? Now, the wisdom of the world is going to be in tune with the world. Okay? The wisdom which is of God, the Spirit of God, is going to be in tune with the things of God. Now, you can build into your understanding, and that's generally how we come into this world. Behold, I was shaping in iniquity and sinned it, my mother conceived me. We're born sinners, and we're born with that sin nature. And so we, we gravitate towards, you know, the things of the world naturally, instinctively, because we're born sinners. And those things automatically show up and demonstrate themselves in the details of our life. And the things that we learn, if we're not learning the things of God, we're learning the things of the world. And you learn to live and think and function and operate the way the world does. Over in Ephesians 4, 17, take a look over there. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17, Paul writes here, he says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, how? In the vanity of their mind. Your walk, lost or saved, originate from the mentality of your soul. Okay? Uh, when, when life operates on the basis of some kind of knowledge. Okay? That's the way life functions. That's the way life works. Now, again, sin in the flesh guides and directs that life in one, in one direction. Well, building the Word of God in the mentality of your soul directs that life in an entirely different direction. Okay. Um, for the sake of time and not to get lost, and I don't mean to get too, too bogged down trying to explain all of that, but I just want to make it clear that uh, our lives don't automatically reflect the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't automatically refl reflect who God has made us in Christ. Okay? And so the, the how, again, is what I'm trying to, to address here and to speak to here. And, and I started out by saying to you how not to be like the Thessalonians rather than how like not to be like the saints at Thessalonica, how to be like the saints at Thessalonica rather than the saint being like the saints at Corinth. And um, if you look at First uh, Thessalonians and you compare that with First Corinthians, um, you, you see the Cor they're both saints. Paul addresses them both as saints. And so he looks at the church, at, at the saints at Corinth, he looks at the saints at Thessalonica, and he, he, he speaks of them 
based on their position in Christ. Uh, Paul knew that the Corinthians had believed the gospel. Paul knew that the Thessalonians had believed the gospel. But when you look at the life of the saints at Thessalonica and you look at the, the life of the saints at Corinth, something made a big difference. And something the Thessalonians did and something the Corinthians didn't continue to do. Okay, let me say it that something the Thessalonians continued to do upon being saved is something that the Corinthians did not continue to do upon being saved. In 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, I'm just going to read down just a little bit through chapter 1 here. Paul and Sylvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Now, that was true of the saints at Corinth. Okay? That was true of the saints at Corinth. But then the difference, in, in, as Paul goes on to write here in verse 6, in verse 6, Paul says concerning the Thessalonians, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Archaea. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Archaea, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Now, Keep, hold your, keep your place there in Thessalonians, but now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. And that's just another way of saying, knowing, brethren, beloved, you're election of God. He knew they were saints. He knew they were saved. With all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ that in everything Ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if it stands out immediately to you how Paul... Uh, speaks concerning the Thessalonians and how he speaks concerning the Corinthians there. But in 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, he says, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. But concerning the saints at Corinth, he simply says, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God on always on your behalf. You see, the Thessalonians, we give thanks to God always for you all. The Corinthians, 
we thank God on your behalf. Okay. They want continuing. In fact, uh, Paul thanking God on their behalf kind of says to me in, in, that they were unthankful for all that God had done. They did not respond with thanksgiving, as it were. Um, and Paul could only thank God for the grace of God which was given them. They were enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But coming behind in no gift, the spiritual gifts flourished in the Corinthian church. And I believe part of their problem was those spiritual gifts and their response to those spiritual gifts operating in their midst. They had a negative, they had a negative response. They had the wrong response. They thought more of themselves. They were exalted by the fact that those gifts was in their midst and were flourishing to the degree that they were, like probably like, like in no other church, you know, of the Gentiles. And one of the reasons for that, the Corinthian church was heart fast joined, heart joined to a Jewish synagogue. And during that time, God was, in that transition, God is still bearing witness to the Jews. And those gifts was in their midst, not because they were spiritual elites. They were anything but spiritual elites. And, and, and yet, in spite of all of that, those gifts flourished in their midst. And so apparently they misinterpreted the gifts as being some kind of a sign of their spiritual maturity. And it was anything but a sign of their spiritual maturity. Spiritual gifts operate in the church when they were operating was no sign of spiritual maturity. Again, 1 Corinthians 14 talks about those things being a, a sign to them that believe not. Okay? And it was a witness and it was a testimony to the Jews. The Jews require a sign. And so... The Corinthian church, again, because of their unique situation, had those gifts flourishing in abundance in their midst, and they misinterpreted those things. And rather than um, them being influenced by the doctrine, rather than them taking instruction from the doctrine that Paul was teaching, again, they... they, they they base their life on experience. And, and because they did such, um, they were, they leaned more toward their flesh and the things of the world, the wisdom of the world. And, and that was the fundamental problem for the, the saints at Corinth. And that is why you have such... Uh, sin in their, in their midst because of such things. Now, so when you, again, you contrast, the, the Thessalonians, their faith groweth exceedingly. And so Paul could thank God for them, okay, um, because of, of the work, second, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, for this, uh, the word of God which worketh effectually, effectually worketh rather, in them that believe. Well, that's what God's word was doing in the Thessalonians. It was not doing that in the case of the Corinthians. You remember Ephesians 5.14? Um, when Paul says, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. You see, the fact that God has given us life doesn't mean we're going to 
uh, lay hold of that life. It's not automatic. And, um, and, you, and you have an adversary. We don't live in a vacuum. We have an adversary. And so um, depending on how you respond to the word of God, to the preaching of God's word, is going to determine really the results that you get in the, de in the details of your life. Uh, the Corinthians had the wrong response. They did not glorify God. The Thessalonians did. They did glorify God. And they lived in a manner that was pleasing to God. The Corinthians lived in a manner that was unpleasing to God. Now, to, you know, to glorify God, to live so as to please him. Now, go back to 2 Thessalonians 2.13. Because there's something Paul says. He says, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord. Bound to give thanks. And when you read 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians, again, he says, we give thanks to God for you. In 2 Thessalonians, he says, we are bound to give thanks for you. In, in 1 Thessalonians, we are bound to, to thank God for you because of the, um, the positive response that they had to the, the work of faith, the labor of love, the patience of hope. But it didn't just stop with that response. In 2 Thessalonians, you, you, you learn that they, they, that response, let's see here. If you look back at chapter 1 in 2 Thessalonians, Chapter 1, verse 3, but we, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because your faith groweth what? Exceedingly. And the charity of every one of you all toward each other abounded. So from 1 Thessalonians to 2 Thessalonians, that was increased. Okay, if this, that's the kind of increase you should be looking for, by the way, if you... <laughs> always hearing the, the stuff about increase from the, the Word of Faith movement. But that's the kind of, you want to have the kind of increase that the Thessalonians had. Okay. Uh, their faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other abounded. And again, uh, verse chapter 2, verse 13, we are bound to give thanks to God for you. Now, he goes on to say there, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to what? To salvation. God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Real quick. Um, Look at Acts 13. God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. In Acts 13, verse 46, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, that is, the Jews. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to who? To the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for what? Salvation unto the end of the earth. And so Paul says, uh, for God... For God, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Look at Romans 11, 11 and 12. Romans 11, 11 and 12. I say then, have they, Israel, stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall... What? Salvation is come unto who? Unto the Gentiles. 
Okay. First uh, Timothy. Chapter one, verse fifteen and sixteen. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should what? Hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now what's my point? chosen you from the beginning God has chosen you to salvation and that beginning is in when God ushered in the dispensation of grace at a time where it was right for God to pour out his wrath and his judgment upon Israel who had now joined the nations in their rebellion against God and against his anointed God ushered in the dispensation of grace instead. By the Lord Jesus Christ coming back into this world and revealing himself to the chief of sinners, Saul of Tarsus, who was leading the world in rebellion against God and against his anointed. The one who thought within himself to do everything contrary to the name of Jesus. But rather than destroying his chief enemy he saved them and with that act of salvation God ushered in the dispensation of grace that was the beginning of the dispensation of grace and he raised him up and made him an apostle to the Gentiles to again through Israel's fall salvation hath what come unto the Gentile the beginning of sending salvation to the Gentiles began with the salvation of the chief of sinners, Saul of Tarsus. And, and, and he raised him up to be, what did Acts 13 say there? That thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the world. God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation. And that, by the way, being chosen to salvation. Um, you remember Israel? God delivered them out of Egypt. That deliverance was what? Salvation for Israel. He delivers them out of Egypt. Exodus 19.4 says, Remember how I bore you on what? Eagle's wings. And brought you to who? Unto myself. Israel was delivered. Israel was saved unto who? Unto God. Um, you, you look at some, you remember he sent Moses to Pharaoh. What did he tell Moses to tell Pharaoh? Let my people go that they might serve me. Salvation for Israel was to was unto God, unto, unto the Lord to serve him. They weren't delivered unto themselves. They weren't delivered to, uh, to live unto themselves. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, that they which live should not, what? Live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And so I see in that chosen unto salvation is the fact that God chose you to live unto him. Chosen to salvation. Chosen to serve him. You know, people always talking about God has a wonderful plan for your life. Do you know God's plan for your life? Well, God's plan for your life, God has chosen you to what? To salvation. That's God's plan for your life. And when I think about that, time is, is already gone. But when I think about that, um, when you think about God's plan for your life, it's, it's salvation, chosen you to salvation. And then, you, you know, instead of getting bogged down in a quagmire trying to figure out 
whether you should go this direction or you should go that direction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if, you, if you simply know God's will, to know God's plan, and he's expressing it in those words, God has chosen you to salvation. That's his will. That's his plan. God has chosen you to salvation. To know that, okay, all the decisions in life are covered by that or governed by that purpose. Every decision you make is covered by God's plan for your life. And God has chosen you to salvation. And so the key to making the right and the best decisions in life is to be thoroughly knowledgeable of God's purpose. Again, God has chosen you to what? To salvation. And so you become thoroughly immersed in that salvation that God has for you, that God has chosen you to. Secondly, you know, he said, through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. So simply walking after the spirit. Now, the spirit is invisible. You can't see him. So how do you follow the spirit? You know, how do you walk after the spirit? Okay. Um, it's just simply living in the identity of who you are in Christ. Okay. You're created in righteousness and true holiness. That's what God has chosen you to. Righteousness and true holiness. And we are to live in that identity, to live in the identity of who we were. I'm just going to submit to you on that point, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 20. Go there and read that. Ephesians 5, chapter, chapter 5, verses 1 through 21. And thirdly, we are to be obedient to, you know, to the dispensation of God given us. He says, God has chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and what? Belief of the truth. Knowing God's purpose walking after the Spirit, and then being obedient to the dispensation of God given you through the Apostle Paul, which is the dispensation of grace. All in all, what you learn is that your, your, your Christian life doesn't operate on the basis of ignorance. And it doesn't, pro it doesn't operate properly to the glory of God unless you're walking in the revelation of God to you. And Ephesians 3, verse 1 and 2, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentile, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God given me to you. Okay? And so when we walk in that revelation, when we know these things, you know, that's the greatest incentive for living the Christian life, the greatest motivation. Because your, 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 your Christian life doesn't operate on the basis of ignorance. It doesn't function in a superstitious manner, uh, you build into your understanding the truths that God, the revelation that God has given you. And that truth, you know, as Paul, you know, the, the, the gospel, let you only let your conversation be as it becometh, the gospel of Christ. So you have your justification, sanctification, and glorification, that hope, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing, and having that hope, as uh, one writer says, if, if you have such a hope, um, in him, you know, having such a hope, every man that hath such a hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. So when we think about salvation, God has involved us in a uh, salvation plan to have total and complete victory over sin. Not just from the past, not just from the present, but one day in the future. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word. And Heavenly Father, we pray that if there's nothing else that we take from this confidence, that our lives doesn't operate on the basis of ignorance. We need to build into the mentality of our soul the word of God rightly divided. And we ask these things with prayer and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.